amazing to just see how far HMS has come in educating the consumer and educating the marketplace and making better products so that we can all have greater foods. And tonight is about wine. The Herzog family is doing this for eight generations. We've been making wine for eight generations. In, in the U.S., we're doing this since 1948. Now, like I said, we can make fantastic wines. It's something that we work on, and we try to get better every year at doing it. But when you put wine in a bottle, one of the things that is most important is how that wine will be consumed. So I can assure you that anything we put the Herzog name in is going to be something that we focus on the quality, starting from the grapes, to the production, to the process, to the bottling. But once a consumer purchases that bottle, that, bo that continuous care has to be ongoing. And, you know, tonight we're, we're learning more about Sub-Zero in our little conversation we had with Yadira. It's just amazing how much care and attention goes into all that detail. I'm looking to learn more about that tonight myself. But storing wine, aging wine, and investing in the, in, in the equipment that's going to store the wine is definitely going to ensure a better product and ultimately something that you're going to enjoy more. Um, you know, we're staying, it's, next week is Rosh Hashanah, it's the beginning of our new year. I want to wish everybody a wonderful, happy new year. Really nice to meet everybody. Just a special shout out to my colleague Jay Booksbaum. We talk about enduring, long-lasting relationships. Jay is with our company for 30 plus years. Um, another special shout out to a gentleman who is really moving the idea of better food and better wines forward is our friends from Fleischix. One of the best, <laughs> one of the best, smartest people that I've ever met in the food and wine industry. So a big shout out to Fleischix. And thank you all for coming and enjoying great wine and improving the quality of wine and food. And may we all have a blessed, happy, healthy new year. Thanks for having me tonight. We're going to kick off the Instagram live, yep. and we'll have more on AJ Madison and appliance education and how we're here to help everyone. This is our 20th anniversary year, so we're pretty excited about that. Thank you. Thank you. Not at eight generations, but we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. So there's a lot of great um, appliance experts here this evening for any questions that you might have. We're really looking forward to um, to taking you and having you taste each of the wines. So I'm going to turn it over to Jay and Yadira, and um, uh, you're going to be on also? Okay. All right, great. So have fun. And okay, my name is Jay Booksbaum. I've been in the wine industry since I was four, and I'm only 34, so that's a lot. Uh, first thing I want to do is teach you properly how to open up a bottle of wine. A lot of people don't know. And this is uh, my favorite corkscrew. It's called the Wager's Corkscrew. And it looks like a pocket knife. The first thing is you open the knife. Put the, and here's where a lot of people make their first mistake. You don't, I don't put it under the top lip. I put it under the second lip. And all you do is hold the thing hard in your fist and just turn the bottom. And look how beautifully it takes the cap off. Okay? And then this is where people make their first mistake. They forget to close the knife. <laughs> we can't tell you how many people end up with stitches in their thumb at the emergency room after having prepared all night long to have a wonderful romantic dinner with their you know, loved one, and then you know, they forget to do that. So then you open up the uh, screw. We call it the coil. It's, you put it in the center of the cork. And here's where people make their next mistake. This coil is actually extruded from a solid piece of metal that you can see. We're a small group, so you can see it. But you put it in, you don't go to that. You, you want to see where there's one half of turn still open. And then a lot of people do this. They put it between their knees, right? Or they ask their significant other to pull it apart, right? Or they try to do it themselves. Well, this is a wonderful little gadget. It actually pivots. And this is called a two-step corkscrew. The first step, you put it on the edge of the gla of the rim, and you don't, don't push away from you. Actually, pull it towards your chin. Okay. Then do it again. You have a second edge of the glass. Pull it towards your chin because if you pull it away from you, sometimes the cork will break, and you don't want a half a cork in a bottle, especially. Again, you've got this romantic dinner going, you know. So, and that's how to properly open up a bottle of wine. Now, what I'm going to do tonight 
is I'm going to talk to you about all the wines, but I'm going to start with only one and open up only one. Then, now this wine, this wine comes from, uh, comes from Wittgen. It's, it comes from the Galilee area, which is the northern part of California. I'm sorry, California. <laughs> in the northern part of Israel. And if you think about Israel, Israel is the shape and size of what? Which, New, Jersey. which New Jersey, correct. But it's also the shape, it's not as large as, but it's the shape of another very, very well-known state in this country. Which one? California. It's long and thin. It's 300 miles long. California is a lot longer than that. But what that does is it gives you a diversity of terroir, diversity of uh, you know, t uh, mountains and, and, and valleys and even desert. And some wines are actually grown in the desert. Well, this is 100% Carignan, which is a wine that is grown primarily and well-known for grown along the Mediterranean in the southern part of France and in parts of Italy, but mostly in the southern part of France. It's made from some of the oldest vines in Israel in modern times, which is about 30, 35 years old. And this winery focuses in on only making grapes and wine from grapes that are grown in the Mediterranean. So this is 100% um, Carignan, and what you know when you when you lift your glass, you want to hold the glass either by the stem or the base. And the reason you don't want to hold it here is because if you used a, uh, a sub-zero refrigerator, the wine will come out of that refrigerator perfectly chilled at exactly the right temperature. And if you put your hand on the glass, you're going to mess that up. So you want to hold it when it comes out of that sub-zero. You want to hold it here so that the wine remains in its, in its the state that it's supposed to remain. It is going to warm up a little, and that's good, because it releases more esters. It releases more aromatics. Okay, And then, so, I mean, there's a real simple thing. We're not going to do this, the long version tonight. I usually do it, but we're going to do the short version tonight. There's a real simple way to become an expert winemaker. The first is the S of sight. You want to look for color and clarity. The second is the S of swirl. That's two S's. The third is the, and the reason is because you want to flatten out the wine and aerate it as much as possible. The third is the S of smell. So everybody's going to take your perfect little noses and put it in the glass. And what you're looking for is aromas that you already know. Fruit, oak, alcohol is in every wine. You know, if there's too much alcohol, that means it's out of sorts. And the fourth S is the S of savor. Don't think me rude. All good wine tasters do that. And the, fourth, the fifth S, of course, is the S of either swallow or spit. This wine is being paired with, is being paired with a chili garlic grilled baby chicken. And the, this kind of chili garlic grilled baby chicken is spicy. Carignan is known for that. So it's spicy. And it's also very Mediterranean, uh, that kind of dish. And this is a Mediterranean wine. The second wine, again, we're not going to open it. You're going to be able to taste them all at the station with the wine, with the food. This is Herzog's own Chenin Blanc. Now, what's really wonderful about this Chenin Blanc is two things. First of all, it's probably the most medal-winningest wine in California ever. And that includes gold and silvers and even bronzes. But overall, it's won more medals than almost any wine out of California. But the question is why? And the answer is, is that it comes from a very special vineyard called the Prince Vineyard. And it's made, that Prince Vineyard is what we call an estate vineyard, which means that the Herzog actually own that vineyard. So they control it, they control the quality of the grapes from the time it's grown. And, you know, I had a, an old friend of mine over 30 years ago when I was in a different wine business. And he said to me, there's only three things that matter in making great wine. You know what those are? Can anybody tell me what the first thing is? Anybody? Come on, somebody. Grapes. Grapes, very good. You got it right. What do you think the second thing is? Soil. Soil, Soil. wrong. What do you think, what, what he told me anyway. What do you think the second thing is? Anybody? Weather. Weather, wrong. Okay. Okay, what? Aging. Aging, okay, so now it's a trick question. The first thing is grapes. The second thing is grapes. 
and the third thing is grapes. So when you, when you want to put one of your wonderful steaks on a, on a wolf, okay, you got to make sure that your, your steak comes from, is, is really wonderful, grade A and perfect, because you can probably make an acceptable steak from bad meat, but you can't make a great one. And if you want to make great wine, you got to do the same thing with grapes. So the Chenin Blanc comes from great vineyards, and it's all a steak bottle. Carmel, another Israeli wine. By the way, that's from California. And we have wines tonight from all different parts of the world. We have French. We have um, uh, Washington State, California, and Israel. And this wine is a Cabernet selected from uh, Carmel. It's one of the largest wineries, not one, it's probably one of two of the largest wineries in Israel. It's a really delicious wine. It's 100% Cabernet. It comes from the Chomron. So think about the Chomron as more of a, a rolling valley. So it gets lots of sunshine and real good ripeness. And as a result, even though it's a relatively inexpensive wine, it'll be full and rich and flavorful because of that ripeness that it gets during the, uh, during the harvest, I'm sorry, during the growing season. And that's, and that's uh, paired with a grilled skirt steak with chimchurri. And, and then we're going we're gonna to have uh, the Pacifica, well, all right, we'll go to the Malartique. The Malartique is a magnificent, magnificent <coughs> Grand Cru Classé from Lelon. Lelon is a, Passac Lelon is a tiny area within Bordeaux. And this is a Grand Cru, which means, and it, you have to qualify by the government and who are the people that qualify a wine to be a Grand Cru? It is actually the winemakers themselves. They taste these wines blind. This is a Grand Cru. It's magnificent wine. It's a blend of, it's a blend of Cabernet, Merlot, Cabernet Franc, and Petit Verdot. And the reason why that's important is because it gives it a complexity and a richness that is very hard to come by in any other way. And that wine is paired with a um, a bourbon boneless spare rib. And so it's a rich, thick, full-bodied wine. Uh, we're going to go out a little bit out of order. This is an orange muscat. It's a late harvest orange muscat. So if you're celebrating the Jewish New Year, all right, and you want something sweet for a sweet New Year, or you're not celebrating the New Year, and you just want something sweet with a delicious dessert, which you're going to have, Okay, this is a wine that goes with that well. It's what late harvest means is, I'm sure some of you have taken a bath and noticed that your fingers start to shrivel and get all, you know, right? And they kind of shrivel up. Well, that's what they do. They wait. The um, harvest take, is taking place right now, starting in August and goes through October, kind of. But they wait for this to late October, November, when the grapes start to shrink, water goes out of them, it's, they're almost like raisins, halfway to raisins, and as a result, they're much more sugar, much less water in the grapes, and the resultant wine is a much sweeter, much richer wine. And finally, yes? We have a whole variety here of wines, different yes. types of wine. You're going through the different types of what they pair with. Are they all treated the same way once they're stored, um, or they're ready to be used? Can you give us a bit of a... Yes, great question. Um, so. Yeah, it, what's, what's wonderful, and I, I, I didn't believe they actually did this. I hope I'm not wrong about saying this. You have, you have the same refrigerator that has two different settings, correct? That's correct. Our sub-zero wine storage units are designed to store your reds and whites separately. You set the temperature yourself, and that's how it would store either short or long term. So you, have, you have two different zones in the same fridge? Yes, you have two different zones in the same fridge. And in addition to that, and we have two examples behind me, you know, they have argon glass, so it protects from UV lighting. It has humidity control, so your corks don't dry up. Um, there is vibration control, so it truly has all the characteristics you need to preserve for a long period of time. How, you know, how long? Like, how long are we talking about? Well, this segues perfectly from what Morty Herzog was saying, that, you know, we can control the great estate grapes from Malartique or from Baron Herzog Chenin Blanc or from the Pacific Northwest for its terroir. But once you get it at home, you got to put it in a sub-zero. Otherwise, what's going to happen is, is that it'll last, but it won't be quite 
as good as when you first brought it home from the store. So if Sub-Zero can, and I didn't even know that, they actually do the humidity as well. And the humidity is, is important because when you, when you lay a wine on its side, okay, one of the reasons you're laying the wine on its side is so that the liquid will fill up the, will fill up the cork and seal off the bottle. But if you're, not, if you're putting it in a place where there's no, not the proper humidity, eventually that cork will dry out and you'll end up getting air, or more air than you'd like, into the, into the bottle, which will cause an accelerated um, aging process, which is not what you want. You want it to age in its time. So it, I, I had no idea that they actually incorporated the humidity into that. It's fascinating to see how it will evolve. I actually have a friend who collects wine. And somewhere right here off of Jackie Robinson, they have like near the cemetery, they have these caves where he's been saving his wines in like a special cellar. But nowadays apparently you can store it at home with you know a good quality wine fridge. And I know people, very well very wealthy people, who have beautiful homes, who have who have decided to build wine cellars, and sometimes they build their wine cellars, but in addition to that, we were just talking about that, in addition to that, they'll have a special group of, of sub-zero wine fridges within the wine cellar for their extra special wines. Or they'll have a couple of uh, sub-zero wine cellars in their dining room so that the, you know, the latest wines that they're using for that evening or for that week or for that uh, holiday period will be readily available. So it's really, really important. Finally, the last wine that I'm going to tell you about comes from the Pacific Northwest. And there's something called in the wine world, we call this terroir. And terroir simply means the taste of the place. So it includes the, the, you know, the water that, that rains down, and the water that's in the ground, and the, the type of earth there is, and the wind, and the snow. Because you even want snow because it gives your grapes complete dormancy during the winter, which come back stronger and more vigorous during the growing season and makes better wine. But I can't think of. And, you know, I, I, I told uh, Yadira. Yadira. I told Yadira if, you know, if there's any special deal on any of these ah, wine fridges, please, I have a home for it. <laughs> okay? So I'm, I'm very excited to be part. You know, we, we were talking about working much more together because we, you know, as, as, wine, as vintners, uh, especially the Herzogs, we want to see that when you taste that wine, even in three, six, or 16 years from now, that it has the same quality that when we first bottled it, or actually evolved correctly from when we first bottled it. So thank you very much for having me. I'm very glad to be part and parcel with this wonderful group. And uh, please enjoy the wines and enjoy the foods. Thank and we'll, thank I'll you be around much. for a little while answer, to answer any questions. Thank you, Jay. From, on my part, it's actually it's fascinating to see how these fridges have actually become a design element in people's kitchens, more than just a fridge and storage. Really um, and we thank Sub-Zero Wolf Co. for uh, joining us tonight with AJ Madison. And we would like for you to please come try the wines, grab a bite to eat.